In this next talk, I'm going to pull together several of the ideas that we've met in previous talks. Still thinking about this kind of collection of stringed instruments, and I'll particularly be talking about the violin and the cello this time. Now, here is a picture I've shown before of uh, the first few mode shapes of a typical violin body, so-called signature modes. And I said when I did it before that these were measurements. And the main thing I'll be talking about today is how those measurements were done. But before we do that, I just want to say a few words about these four mode shapes in the light of the previous talk on sound radiation. Now, first, you need to be clear how to interpret these plots. So for each mode shape, such as this top left one here, you've obviously got the view from the front and the view from the back. And the way to think about combining those into the three dimensional image is to think of folding it on this line in between like a book. So this edge of the top goes with this edge of the back. This left hand edge of the top goes with the right hand edge of the back, which gets folded around underneath it. The colour coding means outwards as seen by the box. So when you get the same colour on both sides, it means the top and the back are moving away from each other or towards each other. When you get opposite colours on the top and the back, it means that they're moving together. So this first mode, known in the violin jargon as A0, and you can see what that looks like. The top is bulging outwards, the back is also bulging outwards. So the whole box is inflating and deflating. And this is the air mode that the Helmholtz resonance, or the modified Helmholtz resonance, that I talked about in an earlier talk. A0 stands for air mode. Uh, what is happening is that the main business going on here is to do with the air pressure inside the box and air flow in and out through the F holes, which we're not seeing in this measurement. We're only imaging the structural response. But the structural response is that the pressure inside the box is going up and down. And what that's doing is sort of pumping the box up like a bicycle pump. Uh, and that's what you're seeing here, both the top and the back bulging out and then bulging in. The net effect has volume change, although these pictures are a little misleading, because if you remember back to the talk about the Helmholtz resonance, uh, we talked about how the Helmholtz air mode couples to the vibration of the body. And we found that for the lowest mode, which this corresponds in the violin, actually the airflow through the F holes is in the opposite phase to this air um, the volume displacement by the body. So actually, although this mode does involve net volume change, what you're seeing in this image is kind of counterproductive volume change. The main volume changes from the invisible pistons of air in the F holes, and they're, they're to some extent being cancelled out by the volume change of the box inflating. Nevertheless, the mode does have net volume change, so it's a monopole source in the far field, so it's a fairly good sound radiator. This next mode, if you think about folding that like a book around this line, you'll see that the top is in orange in the same place that the back is in blue, and everywhere throughout this pattern, the top and the back have got opposite colours. So essentially the back and the top are always moving together, so this is really like a vibration uh, pattern of a, of a sort of thick, flat plate. But there is no volume change to speak of. The top and the back are always uh, cancelling each other out. So this is not a good sound radiator. The next two, the two in the bottom line, are kind of twins. And the names indicate this B1 minus and B1 plus. The minus and plus is because in the early days of violin measurement, uh, people only found one mode here. They called it the main body resonance. Then they found it actually was a combination of two things. So they're B1 minus and B1 plus. 
The most evocative name that's been given to these is the baseball nodes. Now the white line in these graphics shows the nodal line. So you see what the white line does. It goes across the back here, off the edge, comes back on the edge on the top, runs lengthways down the violin, goes off the edge here, reappears on the back and goes crosswise, off the edge here, reappears on the top and then lengthwise. So there is a single nodal line which snakes around the whole body of the violin in a pattern very much like the seam on a baseball. Now you look at the one on the right and it's more or less the mirror image. It's again got a single sinuous node line roughly like a baseball seam but now this one is lengthwise on the back and crosswise on the top which is the opposite way round to the one on the left. It's also not symmetrical and the, the lack of symmetry is because of the influence of the sound post on this which I talked about in the previous talk on sound radiation. Both of these modes, because of the influence mainly of the sound post to some extent of the bass bar, both these modes do in, are strongly driven by the strings through the bridge and they both involve significant volume change. So these are really important sound radiating modes in the lowish frequency range of the violin. But that's not the main purpose of today's talk. The main purpose is how did George do it? It says these are measurements. Well, here's a picture of George doing a measurement, assisted by Eileen Zhang. And we're going to look about roughly how this measurement works. So let's look carefully at this picture to see what he's doing. Obviously, in this case, he's measuring a cello rather than a violin. At first glance, you might think that the cello is resting on its back on the table, but that would be a bad idea because that would stop the back from vibrating properly. But it's not. Look at this end. The pink thing here is a rubber band and the cello is being held up, suspended on this rubber band around its end pin and invisible at the other end from these two wooden bits you can see here is another rubber band underneath the neck. So the cello is suspended on two rubber bands. The whole thing is fairly free and bounces around a bit uh, and all the main plate areas are entirely free to vibrate. Something else you can see is that the string vibration has been damped in much the same way that a piano tuner will damp unwanted string vibrations when they're trying to concentrate on one particular tuning and they do that by wedging soft wedges in between the strings so that's what George has done he's wedged, wedged some bits of foam in the after lengths and also between the playing lengths of the string. He's using a single sensor on the end of this orange wire as a little accelerometer stuck on somewhere it doesn't actually matter where. In his hand he's holding one of these miniature impulse hammers that we saw in an earlier picture. So he's tapping at some particular position on the cello body, recording the result with this accelerometer. The whole thing is being swallowed into the computer which Eileen is in charge of on this particular instance. And he does this lots and lots of times by tapping at lots of different positions. And we'll see why that's important in a moment. Essentially, what happens in the computer is that each hammer tap and response is turned into one of these frequency response functions that we have talked about in earlier talks. So the question is, how can you use a lot of frequency response functions to deduce mode behavior? Well, here's a picture we've seen before. This is the frequency response of a single mode. And I can use this to talk through in broad terms how the how George's computer software is working. Now, what is it we want to know? For each mode, we want to know three things. We would like to know the frequency. We'd like to know the damping. That is to say how quickly the vibration decays. And we want to know the mode shape. That's what we were looking at in the pictures a couple of slides back. How can we get those three things? Frequency damping and mode shape. Well, I'm going to talk roughly here. The 
actual software does something a little more sophisticated, but I'm going to give you a plausibility argument for how you can deduce all three of those things. First, for a single mode from data like this. Now, what do we see here? The mode frequency. Well, it's easy to see where that is, at least roughly. It's where the peak is. Now, if you remember, these four curves were for different levels of damping. The red curve goes off the top of the graph and heads off towards infinity. In theory, that's if there were no damping at all, no energy dissipation. The black one, the blue one and the green one have successively higher levels of damping, which we've represented with successively lower values of this Q factor, quality factor. Uh, for what it's worth, the blue one is actually the kind of value you'd expect from an instrument body mode. Q values of around about 30 are rather typical. So, given something like this blue curve, how can we detect the frequency? Well, that's easy, isn't it? The mode frequency is pretty much the peak frequency here. So provided we can see each mode as a separate peak, like this uh, single mode here, we can deduce the frequency simply by locating the peak. What about the damping? Well, we can see in this picture that the damping affects two things. It affects the height of the peak, but it also affects the bandwidth. The peak gets broader. If you ask how far down from the peak value do we have to go before the amplitude has fallen by some level, and the usual conventional thing is by three decibels. And we can see something else that varies as well as the peak height, that bandwidth is very narrow in the black curve. You don't have to go far down here before you get to 3 dBs on this scale. The blue one is wider and the green one is wider still. Now that's the reliable thing to use in the software that's uh, fitting these modal parameters. We'll see why in a second. So we deduce the modal frequency from the peak position and we can deduce the damping, the Q factor, from this bandwidth of each peak. Now, we've measured lots of, uh, of these frequency response functions. For a given mode, the frequency and the damping should be the same in all of them. So actually, you get lots of chances to locate this frequency and this bandwidth, and you can combine those to get a slightly better estimate by doing some kind of averaging process. So there's the frequency and the damping. How do we get the mode shape? Well, for a single mode, we were thinking of this as a sort of mass on a spring single resonator, and there is no issue of mode shape because there's only one thing going on here. But of course, the mode shapes are the thing we most want to know in our violin modes, and they're all the cello that we saw in the previous slide. And they're the things we plotted two slides ago. Um, how do we get the mode shape? Well, we can't get it from any single uh, frequency response position. But now I tell you one more thing, and, and that will explain why we didn't use the peak height to deduce the damping. If we look at lots of different frequency responses measured with different hammer tapping positions, I've already said the frequency and the bandwidth will always be the same, but the peak height will be different in every measurement. And the reason for that is that there's a bit of mathematical theory in the background here, which I'm not showing you as usual. Um, and that theory says that the peak height is influenced by the damping, but it's also proportional to the mode shape amplitude at the particular position where you've measured it. So if we do measurements with lots of different tapping positions, the peak height will be modulated from one to the next precisely by the variation in mode shape. So if we're simply patient enough and we do enough measurements, then we can kind of dot out the mode shape by looking at the variation of the peak height around uh, from position to position. How many do you need to do? Well, the more patient you are, the more measurements you do, the nicer your mode shape pictures will be because all you can do is dot them out at the positions you measure. So to get decent visualizations of mode shapes like the 
animations that I showed in earlier talks and the 2D plots that we saw a couple of slides back, you need to do lots of measurements. And just one example of that, uh, this is a modal measurement grid that I happen to have the graphic for. This is not actually George Stepani's grid. This is the grid of positions that's used by George Bissinger in his extensive modal analysis project on violins. And each one of those blue dots is a place where he taps with his hammer uh, during his measurement. Actually, George's measure, George Bissinger's measurements are done the opposite way around. He keeps the hammer in the same place and he moves the sensor around. But that doesn't make any difference for the essence of this. The important thing is there are lots and lots of blue dots and that's what you need if you want to map out the mode shape with reasonably good resolution so you can understand the physics. So let's sum up what we've learned here. For each mode shape we want to measure three things. We want the frequency, the damping and the mode shape. We can do that by measuring a loss of frequency response functions. The more the better. And typically you'd use a fixed sensor, it's like a very small accelerometer, and you'd tap with your hammer in many different positions. You can do the converse if you like, tap in the same position and move the sensor around. There's a theorem uh, in the mathematical treatment of vibration that says those two things always give you the same answer. Provided the modal peaks are well separated, it's easy to understand in principle how this might be possible. And that's what we've just seen. The peak frequency and the peak bandwidth, those should be the same in every frequency response function. So we get lots of chances to observe those. The frequency gives you the modal resonance frequency. The bandwidth gives you the damping, the Q factor. Now the peak height is the thing that will be different in every frequency response. Theory tells us that it's proportional to the mode shape amplitude at the particular position where you tapped with your hammer. So that means you can kind of dot out the mode shape by the grid of your measurement points. And then the warning. Now I've simplified things. Uh, the actual software that George has written for doing this has to allow for things being more complicated and the main complication is that I've explained all of this in terms of the frequency response of a single mode but of course we're measuring a violin body or a cello body or something which has lots of modes and the peaks aren't always well separated sometimes they get close enough together that the response at a single frequency has contributions from more than one mode and you have to take account of that doing something clever in the software and if you try too hard with that the measurements also become a little less reliable but we needn't go into that here that gives you the flavor of how you can expect to use experimental data like this on frequency response to sh to deduce the kind of mode shapes that we've been seeing in these images throughout the talks